Good morning. The Axe class is coming to you in a different mode today. Uh, I'm on quarantine from COVID, and so this is being filmed in my office at the university. Years ago, I taught at Oklahoma Wesleyan, and one year uh, the catalog description of one of the courses that we were offering invited students to study God's wonderful promise of immortality, or at least that's what it was supposed to say. The problem is the T went missing somehow. And so in our catalog, we were urging students to take a course, a great course on God's promise of immorality. That's a little bit like a reprint I saw of um, Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. There's a line in that hymn that says that a Christian under persecution may have to let go of this mortal life. Same kind of editing happened. The T was missing, and uh, Luther was on record as saying Christians may need to let go of their moral life. Now, Luther had a great sense of humor. I do not think he would have found that funny at all. Two lessons here. One is don't trust spell check. The other lesson is that in our society, probably more people approve the misprint than the original wording of those statements. I mentioned last Sunday that our studies this summer are going to be topical. Well, the topic today is sexual morality. Evidently, the editors of our Sunday School curriculum thought that was an appropriate and important topic for us to study in our world today. Boy, were they ever right. Let's flip the first two passages, though, if you're following in your quarterly. Let's flip the first two passages. Our quarterly starts with the, the wrong view of sex and moves to the right view. Let's reverse that. I'd like to start with Genesis. I'd like to start with where God started. It would be point two in your quarterly, but it's going to be point one for us today. Genesis chapter two, beginning at verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. I really think that a lot of people today would be surprised to hear that sex is God's idea. God created us that way. In fact, it was so important, it's the very second thing that he says about us in the creation story. The first thing is that we're created in the image of God. That we have the ability to think and feel and choose as God does. That we have a spiritual underpinning that connects us with our Creator. That's the most important thing about us. But the very next thing it says in Genesis is, So male and female created he them. Sexual beings. In Genesis, it's important to notice that God places a premium on His creation. And by mentioning our sexuality so early in the story as such an, a, an integral part of the creation story, God's emphasizing its significance to Him and to us. Christians are sometimes accused of being, uh, the word that's often used is puritanical on the issue of sex. It's really not a good choice of words because it misunderstands the Puritans, for one thing. But it's also wrong because it, it seems to imply that, that we believe that sex is somehow shameful or dirty. It's true that Christians don't talk a lot about sex, it's true that Christians don't joke about it constantly. It's true that our vocabulary is not filled with sexual innuendo. But that's not because we think sex is shameful. It's because we think sex is holy. It is a special 
and wonderful gift from God. In fact, in the stages of creation that are mentioned in the Genesis account, God says at each stage, this creation is good. The one thing he says is not good is that Adam should be alone. And then with the creation of Eve, God looked at his finished creation and said, not that it was good, but that it was very good. This was his plan from the beginning. Might be good to say up front, that doesn't mean that sexual intimacy is what marriage is all about, totally and completely. That's not true. You notice the part about partnership. Not good that Adam should be alone. God gave him a partner. The word that's used in Genesis is helper. Now that word is sometimes misunderstood in a way that makes woman sound inferior to man. That's not the intent of Genesis at all. In fact, Scripture uses that same Hebrew word for helper often in the Old Testament, and most of the references are to God being our helper. He's certainly not inferior. And so the point is the partnership that God has given us in marriage. Eve was not meant to be a servant. Eve was not meant to be a slave. Eve was meant to be a partner. You've probably heard what Matthew Henry wrote, but I love this. The woman was made from a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, near his heart to be loved. So sex is not all that a marriage is about. And in fact, marriage itself is not mandated. Uh, singleness is a viable option for some. Singleness with celibacy. But in Israel's culture in the biblical period, and in our culture today, marriage would be, for the most part, the norm. Still, sex is so important in the context of marriage. that Satan seeks to turn something good into something evil. Satan seeks to mar God's creation and to block God's purposes. God's intent was for a man and a woman to be joined together in physical and spiritual relationship, becoming one flesh in an exclusive relationship and a lifelong relationship. That's God's plan. Satan is not a creator. Satan can't create. Satan's work, as he sees it, is to mar God's creation, to ruin, if he can, God's creation. And he must be very proud of the progress that he's made, at least among many. Turning something meant to be exclusive into something far from that. Something no longer a lifelong relationship. Something not even a partnership very often anymore. All in contrast to the way that God originally intended things to be. But that's the Genesis view of the right view of sex. Scripture also gives us the wrong view of sex. Uh, Paul, writing to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 18. This is the text at the beginning of our lesson quarterly today, and here's what it says. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. That's a jolt to the reader, because verse 17, the verse immediately preceding that passage is the key verse in the book of Romans, the one about the just shall live by faith. And then suddenly, verse 18 says, God is angry at sin and will judge it. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised. It's like two sides of the same coin, godliness and godlessness in contrast with one another. Here's another indication, though, that while God hates sin, he loves the sinner. 
His wrath, it says, is aimed at the godlessness and wickedness of sinners. Not specifically at the sinner themselves. We know that God loves all and that God died for all. And the scripture says, even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God was manifested at Calvary that way. His wrath is, named at the, is aimed at the sin rather than the sinner, precisely. Uh, some of you may remember a story I told to illustrate this some months back. But let me tell it again. Uh, a Quaker was awakened by a noise in his house one night tiptoed downstairs to see a burglar ransacking the house. The Quaker went back upstairs and got his gun. Now, Quakers are pacifists, but according to the story, he came back downstairs, aimed the shotgun at the burglar, and said, Son, I would not hurt thee for the world, but thou art standing where I am about to shoot. God's taking dead aim at sin. And anyone who won't let go of it is in the line of fire. Now, God's anger is not limited to sexual sin, of course. There's a whole catalog of sins. But sexual sin is the one that Paul's addressing here in Romans 1 as an example of the waywardness of mankind and failure to follow God's plan and order for our lives. So verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. So Paul's example of sexual sin is homosexuality. 2,000 years later, it remains a battleground issue still today. Just this past week, 113 United Methodist churches in South Carolina disaffiliated from the denomination over this very issue including a very large church in our area. How do we stay faithful to the biblical mandate to love the sinner and yet reject the sin? Well, some take a different path to the answer, and they say the way we reconcile those two things is by denying it's a sin. Solves the problem for them. At least they believe it does. That was very easy, isn't it? Deny that it's a sin. Can we do that with other things? Why stop with this issue? There's a whole catalog of sins in the Scripture. Can we, can we justify each one of those simply by deciding that it's time to do it, to reclassify those things? Well, you know we can't. In today's Society, though, biblical authority is sublimated to personal opinion. If personal opinion can change in its view of this issue, it can change in its view of other issues in the future. And in fact, it has in the past. Someone posted recently, the Bible needs to be brought up to date because the world has changed. That is a staggering thought. The Bible needs to be brought up to date because the world has changed. Well, the world has changed, but God hasn't. The scripture is clear. Same-sex intimacy is not God's plan. Same-sex intimacy is not good for those involved in it, much less for society as a whole. Paul uses two key words in reference to this Practice. The first one is degrading. Paul says those who engage in this practice are degrading their bodies. It's interesting that the freedom to use their bodies is the rallying cry of many. 
today. And not just on this issue. Think about issues like abortion as well. Uh, the, our bodies are where Paul begins his analysis of this problem. It is about our use of our bodies, but not about our freedom to use them any way we choose. This might be a good place to point out that the sin here lies in the act and not in the inclination. The inclination to homosexuality, the inclination to same-sex attraction is a temptation. Temptation is not sin. Temptation leads to sin when it's acted on. Some say, I was born this way. And that may actually be true. There is a debate about nature versus nurture. Uh, it is possible that someone might have these tendencies from early on, from childhood. That's not the same thing as saying the next thing that's usually said, which is God made me this way. That's not right. God's creation in Genesis is perfect. It's the fall that marred God's creation. And anything that's out of kilter with us is not as a result of God's failure in any way. It's as a result of the fall, which is human failure. At any rate, this issue is important because sin doesn't lie in the temptation to homosexuality. Someone who resists that temptation is as free from sin as someone who never had that temptation in the first place. But the sin lies when the body is degraded by the act. We have other negative influences, other negative impulses that we're, we may be born with. And what we're responsible is not for the fact that they are present from early on. What we're responsible for is what we do with them and how they are allowed or not allowed to interrupt our relationship with God. Last month, uh, Pastor John Adams at First Baptist Easley, South Carolina, hosted the president of Asbury Seminary, Dr. Timothy Tennant, for a weekend conference on a biblical view of our sexual identity. Dr. Tennant has done some groundbreaking work on this, and what he shared uh, in that weekend conference was outstanding in interpreting what the Bible has to say about our sexual identity. He said that what we need in this age, an age of increasing emphasis on same-sex marriage, increasing emphasis on gender reassignment, is a theology of the body, a theology that begins with our creation in the image of God and then recognizes how that was tarnished by the fall. A theology of the body. We don't often think of our bodies that way, do we? But creation itself is evidence that God thinks that way. That there is God-given purpose in our physicality, in, in our very created being, in our bodies. He didn't have to make us physical beings but he did. So creation testifies to the fact that our bodies are significant to God. The incarnation of Jesus testifies to the fact that our bodies are significant to God. Not only did God not have to create us as physical beings, God didn't have to become one of us as a physical being, a God-man in Jesus, but he did. And at the crucifixion, he experienced the death of the physical. In the resurrection, the physical was reanimated in what Paul calls later a spiritual body. Still physical enough, though, to show Thomas his scars. Still physical enough to eat with the disciples on the shore, the Sea of Galilee. And plus that, uh, in addition to that, we are promised that our resurrection will be an affirmation of that as well. Uh, that's, that's more than the immortality of the soul. The soul never dies. That's true. But our resurrection 
means the body will one day be rejoined with it. Christianity is the only religion that teaches that. And that in itself is an affirmation of the body. God's not through with our bodies, even at death. So the argument that our bodies are our own business and we should be free to use or abuse them as we choose, simply not true. The architect of our bodies has other plans. And so Paul's first key word here is that the misuse of our bodies is degrading to them and to their creator. Second key word he uses is the word exchange. Multiple times, Paul says people are exchanging something good for something not good when they engage in these practices. They, they exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, he says, and that equals exchanging the truth for a lie. The, the message behind that word exchange is that this is a bad trade. We're trading something holy for something that isn't. We're trading something that's true for something that's false. We're trading something that's good for something that isn't. We're exchanging wonderful things for worthless things. And that's a bad trade. It's wrong not to call sin a sin just because public opinion has shifted. But, and this is key, I think, for our study today, it's also wrong to turn our backs on a person wrapped up in that sin, and that's the mistake that some biblical Christians are making. Not loving the person wrapped up in that sin. If we say we stand with the authority of Scripture, and by the way, that's the key to this whole uh, conflict between the biblical and unbiblical view of this practice, if we say we stand with the authority of Scripture, what we're really saying is we stand with God's authority as expressed in Scripture. Scripture is not our God, but God spoke through Scripture. We hear Him, and we honor Him when we obey it. So if the authority of Scripture is where we stand, then we need to stand with the authority of all of Scripture, and not just those passages about the fact that this sin is wrong. What about the parts that say, our faith is all about loving our neighbor. Jesus didn't qualify that by saying, as long as your neighbor is straight. Jesus said, love your neighbor. Period. Not loving the person who's wrapped up in that sin is also wrong. So, in looking at the perversion of God's perfect plan for men and women in a lifelong physical and spiritual partnership in fidelity to one another and an exclusive relationship, we see how the world got it wrong. We see how Satan has tried to spoil what God has made. And Scripture points us, in a third text, to the right response today. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is the third section in our quarterly. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you've received from God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, key phrase, honor God with your bodies. It doesn't have to be a negative. Paul here makes it a positive. Don't just avoid this sin. He says, honor God by using your body in the way that God intended through creation. Corinth was a good place to make that argument. Corinth was sin city in the biblical period. It was a Mediterranean seaport, had the worst reputation in the whole Roman world for sexual immorality. 
The Roman world was filled with vice, but nowhere was that more obvious or invasive than in Corinth. There was a phrase that was used in those days, a phrase for a person who disregards all moral constraints. The saying was, they're acting like a Corinthian. Wow. What a label to bear. Well, we know from Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, the same book that this passage comes from, that there was a man living there in sexual sin with his stepmother, and that the church took pride in their tolerance of that act. Uh, the world was getting into the church. It'll happen the moment we let our guard down. The world was getting into the church in Corinth. Well, after all, religion in Corinth was already sexualized. More than a thousand prostitutes, temple prostitutes, served at the temple of Aphrodite, the Greek god of beauty, that was in Corinth. More than a thousand temple prostitutes. It means exactly what it says, that men would come for sex with the prostitutes as a religious act, as a way of worshiping the goddess. To this sex-saturated society, Paul said, honor God with your bodies. What would it be like to live in a sex-saturated society? I don't think we even have to ask that question, do we? We know very well what it's like. So when Scripture calls on the Corinthians to repent of their wrong ideas about sex, and remember, our definition here at Alive of repentance is rethinking how we think about everything under God's direction. When Scripture calls on the Corinthians to repent of their wrong ideas about sex, Scripture is calling on America. Scripture is calling on the modern world to rethink its ideas about sex as well. Paul's bottom line in verse 20 is refreshingly positive. Honor God with your bodies. Sex education in school focuses on the biological side of sex. That's one perspective, but it's only part of the story. People need to hear about the theological side of sex as well. It's even more important. Theological understanding of sex says God's its designer, God's its creator, God gave it to us to create lasting bonds, not casual hookups, that those lasting bonds were to be between a man and a woman, that they were last, to last for a lifetime, that he values our bodies and not just our souls and that our physical bodies are to honor Him just as the spiritual side of us honors Him. The theological side of sex, a theology of the body, Timothy Tennant would say. It's true, our sexual drives were marred by the fall. Every dimension of life was marred by the fall. But Christ wants to redeem it. As for those around us, our job is not condemning our job is acting redemptively. When Dr. Tennant was in Easley, he mentioned seeing picketers outside a church conference on this issue, and they were holding signs, signs that said, God's door is open to all. Uh, Jesus didn't turn people away, and neither should we. God loves LGBTQ people. And Dr. Tennant said, I could not agree more with everything those signs said. But I could not disagree more with what they meant. God does love all people. Jesus does welcome all people. The church must welcome and love all people. But love doesn't mean endorsement. And welcome doesn't mean approval. He welcomes us to the restoration of our original design. He welcomes us to the restoration 
of our relationship with the Creator. He welcomes us for a reverse exchange, exchanging lies for the truth, exchanging something that's degrading for something that's fulfilling. That's the welcome that we are to offer to the world. And to do that, we have to remember that biblical mandate, not just to avoid sin, but to love the sinner. God's love today offers something more than the sexual brokenness that's all around us. God offers sexual wholeness. Wholeness and holiness go hand in hand. Let's pray together. Lord, an issue like this can be divisive and hurtful, but it can also be uplifting and redemptive. May your Spirit guide us, not only in our personal choices, but in our relationships with others who have made choices we may not approve of. And may Christ be lifted up, and may God be glorified. May He be honored by the way that we use our bodies, but also by the way we reach out to those who need to use them in the way that they were invented and they were created to be used. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.